Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center for our Crew 9 Crew News Conference today. I am joined in studio by our Crew 9 crew. Going down the line, we have Crew 9 Commander Zena Cardman, Crew 9 Pilot Nick Haig, and Crew 9 Mission Specialist Stephanie Wilson and Alexander Gorbanov. We'll be taking questions from here in the room and on our phone bridge, but before we kick it off, we'll start with opening remarks from Zena. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Hello, welcome. I'm so grateful to see everyone here present in the room with us and also welcome to those tuning in online. I am absolutely honored to be here with my crewmates who have been an incredible team, Nick, Stephanie, and Alex. They have shown so much technical excellence. They are also deeply kind and incredible teammates who have been really fun to work with which has just made this a dream assignment for me. We're also just a part of the Expedition 72 crew, so our colleagues Alexei, Yvonne, and Don Pettit will be launching on a Soyuz in September. We're very thrilled to be getting to work on the International Space Station. Yesterday actually marked the end of a roughly 18-month training flow for us. And so right now we are excited and focused as we turn towards this pre-launch phase of our mission. We're very excited to be here and looking forward to your questions. All right, well, we will start with our first question here in the room. Hi, Will Robinson Smith with Spaceflight Now. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and talk with us today. I wonder, just going down the, the row here, obviously, you know, having the opportunity to go into space is a time to bring some special mementos with you. I wonder what things you're looking forward to taking with you and why you happen to choose those as special things. Thanks. We have a few personal items packed. Of course, for me, one big item is photographs, memories from home, taking with me people who are deeply meaningful to me, family, friends, those who have supported us. I'm also taking things for our ground support teams, the instructors who have trained us, prepared us for our mission, and the people who really make human spaceflight happen on the ground. And so having a piece of them with us in orbit is really special, a great opportunity. Yeah, one thing I'm taking different than, than last time uh, is, is something that didn't exist last time, uh, a Space Force flag. Uh, as an active duty Space Force officer, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to represent all the guardians that help support human spaceflight uh, as they watch the skies and, and the, the cosmos that surrounds the Earth, keeping us safe every day. So that's one of the things I'm taking along. And similarly for me, it's uh, important to be able to share this opportunity in the moment with family and friends. And so I am also taking personal photographs of family and friends to be reminded of them and to stay connected with them and also to help me to tell the story uh, of, of the mission uh, once it's all complete and when we return home. I also take with me photographs of friends and relatives. But there are other things that are important to me and symbolize a certain stage in my life. I will also be taking photographs of uh, my family and my friends, and there are also some other items which are very important for me and which represent different milestones of my life. Например, таким вещам относится эмблема нашего набора, набор 2018 года. For example, uh, the patch of our uh, class, that's 2018 class. А также флаг института, который я закончил в 2014 году. В следующем году институту будет 95 лет, знаменательная дата. Uh, and also the flag of the uh, high education institution that I graduated from in 2014, and next year it will be the 95th anniversary of this institution. Okay, we'll take another question from here in the room. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mark Caro from Aviation Week in Space Technology. Um, my question is, is looking uh, forward to some of the activities you'll be doing and I'm particularly uh, interested in maybe the kinds of spacewalks and the activities that you're prepared for uh, during your months on the station. We have a mission that is jam-packed full of science. Of course, the International Space Station is an orbiting laboratory. This is one of the most important things that we do. And so for me, coming from a scientific background, I'm actually very much looking forward to doing research that's very interdisciplinary, very integrated, and is at varying levels of technological readiness. Some of it is very fundamental research. Some of it is more of a technology demonstration. A lot of the science that we'll be doing is actually research on ourselves as 
human bodies, uh, the way that we respond to the spaceflight environment is incredibly interesting. We're still looking to understand that as we move farther and farther uh, beyond low Earth orbit. And some of the effects that we experience, things like effects on our vascular system, on our genetics, um, are very similar to aging populations and immunocompromised populations on Earth. And a lot of the research that we will be doing, therefore, helps people on the ground. Yeah, t touching on the, um, touching on, you know, the, the spacewalk aspect and the content of some of the things we're going to be doing up there. Obviously, there's been changes. Spaceflight is dynamic. Um, and uh, we're prepared to, to conduct uh, not just what was originally planned for us, but we've been spending the last couple weeks uh, coming up to speed on all those things that uh, got deferred from the summer. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a testament to our training team to get us ready and to be ready to respond and be flexible for all these things. Uh, it's also fun to have our chief training officer here in the audience. Uh, Grant has done a phenomenal job getting us ready, so thank you. Additionally, we will have uh, cargo vehicles that will uh, visit us on the International Space Station. We'll have SpaceX 31, which will bring cargo to the International Space Station. And uh, additionally, uh, Dream Chaser is uh, also scheduled for 2024. So we'll be working with those experiments and those uh, new uh, systems uh, components that will arrive at the International Space Station to complete the mission objectives. OK, we have another question here in the room. Gina, go ahead. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Nick. I'll, uh, sorry, for Nick. Uh, you talked about the U.S. Space Force. Uh, tell me the advantage you have going to the space station to expand the U.S. Space Force presence. And you're a guardian. Uh, how does this all play together for you? Yeah, you, you know, so inside of the astronaut corps, we have... Uh, you know, several active duty military members that are assigned to work for NASA. And that's a, a, we've got a long history of that level of cooperation. And so it's great to be able to, to serve not only in the Space Force, but also serve my nation as part of the astronaut corps. Um, expanding the, you know, what I think the biggest impact of me being on this mission as a guardian is going to be is just raising awareness. Uh, there are a lot of things that the Space Force does that are instrumental to making human spaceflight possible, whether that's providing us support to launch and land or keeping us safe by, by moving us out of the way or warning us of potential debris. Okay, we'll head over to our phone bridge now, but if there are any additional questions in the room, please be sure to get our attention. We will start with Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Thank you. Um, looking at your, the patches that are representing your mission, the Crew-9 patch is colorful and full of symbolism, and then you look at the Expedition 72 patch, and it's almost the most straightforward patch since Expedition 1. Did, did, your, did, the, did your crew lead the design of both patches, and how did that, um, how did those two come about? The Crew-9 patch, of course, was designed with inputs from Crew-9. This one was designed by Blake Dumesnel, who has done a lot of patches for NASA and crewed flights in the past. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in every patch. So for the Crew-9 patch, we, of course, have a Falcon. This is some synergy between Crew-9 and the Falcon 9 rocket on which we will launch. Our destination is the International Space Station. The constellation in the background is Draco as a nod to our Dragon spacecraft and the engines that will take us there. Uh, the colors are also symbolic. The red, yellow, white, and black is actually a nod to the maritime signaling flag for the number nine, a uh, fun fact. And the purple was serendipitous, but we happen to have embraced it deeply. Uh, the Expedition 72 patch was actually led by Don Pettit, uh, who is already in Star City on his way to the International Space Station in September. And it really is a nod to the longstanding history of the space station, which has been human occupied for more than 20 years now. But you'll notice, of course, the space station looks quite a bit different than it did in Expedition 1. And I'm very grateful to be flying with people who actually helped in its construction. Okay, we'll take our next question on the phone bridge from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. This is a question for Nick, I think. Um, how, is the only guy there I know of, anyway, who's, who's been through a, a rocket anomaly. How closely have you guys been able to follow the Falcon 9 uh, anomaly investigation 
and how confident are you uh, in, in your rocket? Uh, any thoughts you have would be appreciated. Yeah, I'm extremely confident in the the team, the approach that they've taken, the the integrated approach in which NASA has been incorporated into the response, and uh, am excited to to strap onto the rocket when the team decides it's time to go. Um, yeah, we've been integrated. We actually were out at, at SpaceX and Hawthorne training, uh, and it was the day after the, the anomaly, and, and from the get-go, they, they brought us into the conversation and, and, and told us everything that they knew. So um, it's been a, a spectacular response. Yeah, I completely agree. We've been so grateful for the transparency and the collaborative nature of this as we understand uh, what happened and how we move forward. We are really confident and we will go when the crew is ready, when the rocket is ready, the capsule is ready, and the space station is ready for us. Okay, we'll head back to the phone bridge. Our next question is from Elizabeth Howell with space.com. Thanks everyone for finding the time. Um, I was curious if you're going to be doing anything fun for some of the sports events that happen, especially in the fall. And so I was thinking maybe the World Series or if you're staying that long for the Super Bowl, um, what, do you, what do you folks wanna do? We would love to be involved with any and all of the sports events, and uh, there's a wonderful public affairs team at, uh, at NASA that I'm sure will uh, work those events for us and, and tell us the best ways that we can contribute. But uh, celebrating sports and wonderful events uh, on Earth is a nice way for us to stay connected, for us to have a little bit of fun uh, aboard the International Space Station. So we look forward to uh, participating in those sporting events uh, as we're able to and as the uh, PR team uh, assembles that, uh, that plan together for us. Okay, we'll take our next question from Sophie with Cosmic Chicago. Good afternoon, thank you for taking my call. Um, this question is for Stephanie. Um, several years, uh, about 14 have passed since your last space flight. And I noticed on your bio that you've done a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, prior to different missions. A lot of us don't get to see that work. Um, one of the panels that you worked on was the, as a representative to increase crew size generic operations panel. It doesn't have an acronym as long as, as far as I know. <laughs> but um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the work that you've done that's informed the current situation on the space station or what you hope to see, um, given that right now we have a huge number of astronauts on station? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, yes, as part of my work uh, in between missions, I participated in a panel, uh, as you said, called the Seven Crew uh, Joint Operations Panel. And at the time, uh, 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 as we were building the International Space Station, initially starting as a crew of three, building up to a crew of six, and then having a, a team to look at how we would, uh, in a stepwise manner, uh, institute and build up the systems that could support Seven Crew. And so all of that work laid the foundation to our operations for today, as we're able to have seven crew members aboard the International Space Station uh, as a steady state, um, uh, as a steady state uh, operation. And um, so excited that as part of being able to build the International Space Station, now having an opportunity to return and to see it uh, all assembled, and actually to have a chance to uh, visit uh, some of the components that I brought up on earlier space flights, but to really see that ongoing presence, to see how the systems continue to operate, and uh, in some cases, some of the science experiments also have continued or stopped for a portion and then uh, recontinued, really looking forward to seeing how things are operating now and uh, having a chance to experience that and tell the story. Okay, our next question is from Douglas with Payload. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, my question, I think it was Zena that mentioned that a lot of the science would be studying how their bodies um, uh, react to a longer stay in space. I was wondering what the mentality is going into uh, a six-month stay on the ISS, knowing that your body is going to be undergoing a lot of stress and, like you said, um, kind of mimicking the aging process. Uh, how do you kind of reconcile that and prepare yourself mentally uh, for that aspect of the mission? For me personally, it's actually incredibly fulfilling. It's such a privilege to fly in space and 
if what our bodies are experiencing can then also help us understand uh, diseases and different effects uh, to compromised populations on the earth. This is incredibly valuable. And so for me, this is just a, a giant privilege. Of course, we know that our bodies are going to experience changes. We do so much to help mitigate and prevent those changes from exercise to support from nutritionists. Uh, I think it's fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to participating in research as both a scientist and a subject. OK, we'll take our next, next question here in the room. Go ahead. This can be for whoever wants to answer this. Um, over the last few crew rotation missions, we've seen some really interesting uh, bites at the apple, if you will, of how to share what you know the day in life is like on board station. Do any of you have anything in particular, either in collaboration with some folks that are there, currently on station or have been on station that you're kind of, you know, cooking up behind the scenes that you can share with us? Yes, I think we all have different approaches to this, which I absolutely love. Uh, on board during our expedition, we will have crew members who were born in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so we all have a really complex story to tell. Uh, Don Pettit, our crewmate launching on Soyuz, uh, is an incredible photographer. I'm really looking forward to not only seeing what he produces, but learning from him and hoping that I can get even a tiny little bit of his expertise while we're there. Uh, and Stephanie, meanwhile, really wants to share the story of how Station has evolved since she started participating in its construction. But I'll let other people uh, add how they want to contribute. Yes, I would, as Zena mentioned, like to, uh, in a way, chronicle uh, the assembly of the International Space Station and uh, over uh, the period highlight certain components or systems or payloads or uh, window facilities that we have added to the International Space Station and try to tell the story of perhaps how that uh, component flew and some initial uh, information about the background and then how it's being operating today. I think that that's a great way to tell the story of the International Space Station. It is a wonderful orbiting laboratory that we have the honor of working uh, with our colleagues, our international colleagues, and doing this international research. And uh, it's just one way that we can tell our story and uh, bring everyone along with us. Okay, we'll take another question here in the room. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News, actually for all of you. Um, you know, two of you have been to the space station before, and last week we heard the plans on how station will be deorbited. So is this a little bittersweet for you guys going up to station? You know, there's, there's a lot of time before we get to 2030, and so I'm looking forward to all the things we're going to accomplish before we get there. Um, it is amazing what you are able to, to get involved in over the course of six or seven months. Um, it, it's, you just become part of this machine, uh, this living, breathing laboratory that's up there, and you feel the extension on the ground to the, to the hundreds and thousands of people that are supporting you day in and day out. And, and then you land, and you've almost forgotten everything that you did up there because you were going so fast and, and chasing that red line and trying to get everything done that you could possibly do. Um, so I'm excited to grab the baton again and see what we can accomplish. And in that same vein, uh, having lived through or been part of the space shuttle program and seeing that uh, retire, uh, of course, is bittersweet. Uh, and then continuing the International Space Station program again uh, with the deorbit vehicle and having uh, the potential end of the International Space Station program will also be bittersweet, but in ending programs, that also means that we're able to extend our work in other programs. So looking forward then to the research and the uh, long duration missions, deep space missions that we will conduct with our lunar missions and, uh, our, and our Mars missions after that. So of course, it does mean that we're closing the book, so to speak, on one phase, but it enables us to do more extensive work in the next phase. Okay, our next question is from David with About Space Today. Good afternoon. I'd like just to uh, talk to uh, Alex about uh, his impression of being possibly trained in a soil and now going to sit in a dragon space capsule. What is it like to him? Ощущения мне великолепны и от Дрэгона, и от подготовки, и от 
предвкушение предстоящего полета? I have great impressions uh, from Dragon and from training and uh, anticipating the upcoming flight. Конечно, была долгая подготовка по Союзу, начиная с времен ОКП. Of course, I had a very long training uh, for Soyuz flights, starting from uh, my uh, ASCAN uh, program. Сейчас, практически в течение года, была подготовка на Dragon и на американском сегменте. And uh, right now, for uh, about a year, I had a training mostly focused on Dragon and uh, U.S. segment. И, конечно, есть uh, моменты, которые можно сравнить в подготовке Союза и в подготовке uh, на корабле Dragon. And of course, there are um, aspects of training that I can compare uh, between Soyuz and Dragon. Ну и в целом я хотел бы сказать, что нужно сравнивать не подготовку как полностью к полету на корабле, а как подготовку конкретных специалистов, конкретные должности в корабле. Например, на Союзе это борт-инженер 2, который сидит в правом кресле, на Дрэгоне это специалист миссии. And uh, I think it's better to compare not training on Soyuz uh, versus training on Dragon, but more training for specific roles. Like, for example, on Soyuz, Flight Engineer 2, which is right seat, um, is similar to a mission specialist on Dragon. С точки зрения затрат времени, с точки зрения обязанностей экипажа, эти должности достаточно похожи. In terms of uh, time uh, needed for this training and the responsibilities, these two positions, they are pretty similar. Основное, что должен иметь как специалист миссии, так и борт инженер 2, это обеспечить свою безопасность как в номинальном полете, так и в случае нештатных ситуаций. So the main responsibilities for both mission specialist on Dragon and flight engineer two on Soyuz that's uh, to provide um, their own safety during the flight, uh, whether it's a nominal flight or during of normal situations. И, конечно, это моя первая миссия, но надеюсь, что не последняя. В дальнейшем я смогу сравнить. Полет на Дрэгоне с полетом на Союзе. So this is going to be my first mission, and I, I hope not my last one. So I still hope to have an opportunity later in the future to compare uh, training and flying flying on Soyuz and Dragon. Okay. okay but my question would be uh, going a little bit beyond that: is is it like from being in a Soyuz, like a small apartment, and now going to a luxury apartment? In comparison. I don't have a translation. Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question, please? True. Sure. Training in, in a Soyuz, is that like uh, a, being in a small apartment and now getting into the Dragon, which is like a luxury apartment? Да, размеры, конечно, у капсул разные, Союз по объему гораздо меньше, Дрэгон побольше, но не стоит забывать, что у Союза есть еще второй отсек, который называется бытовым отсеком. То есть Союз маленький, но двухкомнатный, а Дрэгон большой, но однокомнатный. Yes, that's correct. The size of the vehicles is different. Soyuz is smaller and Dragon is larger. But don't forget that uh, Soyuz has basically two rooms, uh, two smaller rooms, and Dragon has one larger room. Okay, our next question comes from Reed Kisselbach. Hi, thank you for taking the call. Uh, first of all, I just want to wish you all the best of luck on your upcoming mission. Um, I have a question for Stephanie. Uh, we cover a area in upstate New York near Albany, and that includes your actual alma mater of Taconic High School. Uh, and so I was wondering if there's any message you'd like to share with them and any advice you would like to give to kids from our area who may have similar aspirations to one day end up like you. Yes, I uh, very much... Uh enjoyed my time growing up in Western Mass, and uh, I miss uh, that part of the country. It's a beautiful uh, area. I miss the weather and the snow and the skiing and the change of seasons and um, the wonderful community that's there. Uh, 
for my high school, Taconic High School, or in other uh, students in the area. It is a small town, and um, when I was growing up, there were about 40,000 people uh, living in a town of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and I like to say that um, big dreams can come from small places. And uh, I had great support from my family, from my parents, uh, for whom uh, education was very important, and so I'm very thankful that they were uh, encouraging of me throughout my education, and the teachers uh, that I had in that community were also very supportive and uh, instructive, and uh, my message is really find your dream, find what you're passionate about, pursue it uh, with all that you can, and um, even though you might come from a small place, remember that big dreams can come from small places. A great message to end on, and that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to our crew for being here and answering the questions. You can follow the latest on Crew 9's mission to the International Space Station on nasa.gov slash commercial crew. And a quick note for our media, Don Pettit will be available for live shots remotely from Star City, Russia on August 16th, and we have more information about that coming soon. Thanks for joining. We'll be back soon.